right, my name is Sochi Cazador and I lead ecosystem growth at the Cello Foundation. Really thrilled to be joined on this uh, stage here uh, to talk about why refi matters um, and what's next with Helena Merck of Spirals and Luke Weber of Collectivo. All right. Before we get started, I just wanted to do a quick pulse check. How many people in the room uh, know what regenerative finance means? That's not bad. Okay. <laughs> not bad. Any brave souls that want to uh, throw out a definition? All right. Well, we're going to talk about that now. Um, so regenerative finance is this concept that uh, there's an economic system that effectively is contributing value versus extracting value. Um, and uh, would love to kind of invite Helena and Luke to share their definitions and views of it. Yeah. So I think comparing it to the system we have now is actually a really helpful analogy, as in like right now we're living in a world where we have all these externalities, whether it's carbon emissions or you know, other types of externalities, um, and in a regenerative system, those externalities are instead embedded into the system. And a regenerative system you know, is able to create positive externalities for more use. So with, with a regenerative economy, we could have positive externalities and, and nature regeneration rather than na natural extraction. Yeah, and I think a good way to describe it is doing things as nature, really having a full system view and iterating based on those insights, and with every iteration creating more conditions for future development that goes beyond sustainability. There's a really funny quote that one of the um, regenerative farmers in Curacao told me, if someone asks me how your relationship is going and you say it's sustainable, it's generally not that great. It's maintaining... <laughs> But if you say something is regenerative, it goes beyond being sustainable. It really goes, it, it improves things and makes things better. So I think um, that's a good way to describe it. I love that. One other um, way that I've heard uh, described as well is like living in harmony, mm -hmm. which I thought really sat powerfully with me. Um, I'd love to also invite you just to share a little bit about Spirals and Collectivo and what you guys are working on. Yeah, yeah I can go first. So at Spirals, um, we unlock the power of dormant capital and redirect potential yield into climate impact. And what that means in practice, it's kind of like a, you know, a Web3 version of a green bank, where when you put money into Spirals, we work behind the scenes to generate yield and put that yield into forward carbon credits, which then invest into carbon credits, and we can actually heal the planet through that. Um, What's powerful about doing this on crypto is that we can actually create composable building blocks as you're depositing into the, like, the Web3 bank. So when you deposit, let's say, like CUSD into spirals, we mint you green CUSD, which now you can go and use as if it was CUSD. And we're working with a lot of cello partners like Climate Collective and Remox to build these new green primitives. So Remox is a payroll provider, um, and by using spirals, they can build green payroll which retains the utility of paying people in stable coins, but they can do it while the money is working behind the scenes to actually be funding cool projects. Cool. Um, Collectivo is building a toolkit for local regenerative economies. Those are community currencies that are focused on a specific locality, say a small island development state or a specific city. The reason why we do it, I think, relates to the um, panel that we just had before. It's allowing communities to have their own value system and have their own type of currency that they want to use that better represents that. And one thing we're doing is we're creating a new standard called the GeoNFT that allows local communities in a scalable way to issue ecological assets, which they can utilize to back their community currencies to create kind of this regenerative feedback loop where every time they um, provide stewardship of natural assets, they're able to tokenize some of that value use it as collateral for the community currency, and then fund, again, new initiatives um, that will continue the feedback loop in a regenerative way. Amazing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so I think what I really love about the Cello community, it's been this sort of home for refi. Before refi was trending, um, you know, as you heard earlier with Merrick and Avkot's talk, um, 
you know, the white paper was published in 2017 and introduced this concept of natural backed capital. Um, also, uh, Scylla was launched on Earth Day of 2020, and as you heard, the very first uh, proposal was basically to allocate a percentage of the uh, uh, rewards to, um, to offset carbon. And um, I think recently, Forbes um, stated that one of the trends they're seeing for 2023 is really going to be about refi, which is, I think, very exciting. Um, and the moment is is now, especially because I think we're at this point in the world where we have a finite period of time. We need to kind of make some changes for not only our generation, but the generations of our, um, our children. So wanted to kind of just take a step back and think about the refi industry as a whole and um, you know why you think Web3 in particular and refi is uniquely positioned to kind of drive the type of change we need to see in the world? Great question. I mean, I think for me, you know, Web3 is a set of tools to allow us to build new economies. And right now, the UX of our economy drives us to make the wrong decisions. There's this like green premium we talk about a lot, which is like, you know, I'm vegan and it costs me more to be vegan than to eat like really cheap chicken, right? Like that's just broken. Uh, and we need to design new economies that actually align with our values. And blockchain is actually perfectly suited to like help us build new economies. So I think there's this like natural synergy, um, and blockchain is finally at that stage where we can build fast, and, and developer tooling is improving, along with this like rising both consumer and corporate movement into being more sustainable. So these two kind of combining make like the rise of refi like like it feels like. Everything is lining up to make this possible, which you know I think I agree with Forbes. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think the tooling, really seeing it as a tool for economic change, is the way to go. Um, I would even say that we memed this into reality as Cello to some extent. Um, I remember early 2020 when we were first kind of coining the term refi, and it was like, imagine if we could um, embody these regenerative values into a financial system. I mean, maybe to add on top of that, I think the tools are extremely critical, especially for jurisdictions or people that traditionally don't have access to these tools. And then the financial part to it allows you to kind of streamline that energy and then utilize these tools to kind of achieve this mass, mass adoption or this mass movement that you need. It's amazing. Um, one thing that I love about Web3 in particular is this notion of composability. I think Spirals is a great example of that, taking something that is this building block on Web3 and reimagining it to kind of just create some positive change. What are some of the trends or maybe like, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to kind of being built as we think about this, you know, this, this, this future ahead of us? Yeah. I can go if you want. Go for it. Useful NFTs is something I'm super <laughs> excited about. I think there are two movements that we have been contributing to a lot that I'm super excited about. One is soul-bound tokens or some, um, yeah, that goes beyond just a NFT that you can pass along. It's something that's kind of more tied to your address or your identity. I think especially in the context of governance and control systems, that's extremely relevant. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is the GeoNFT standard that we're working on with Astral Protocol which embeds local data, like a specific geographic location, into an NFT, and it can hopefully open up kind of new ways of data markets. And I think those are just two examples of us imagining what you can really do with an NFT um, that goes so far beyond just a profile picture or something. And, and I think that's going to unlock a lot of new innovations, especially in the coming years, as real-world assets are being brought on chain, and we're looking for different ways to leverage that. I think um, DSI and decentralized science yeah how they leverage um, IP NFTs. And you can really see that after this initial NFT mania, now we're getting to the real useful stuff. And that, that really excites me. Definitely watching that as well. There's like, uh, I think the first NFT product is starting to use spirals. And that just makes me so happy. I think as like <laughs> a, as a developer of putting out like tooling to allow people to build, I kind of, I don't have to be as creative like, because they get to decide what are these things that I can build and make them regenerative by default. They can plug spirals in and now, just like they would normally, they don't have to do anything differently. It's like using a stable coin, it's like using Celo, but now their platform is regenerative. They're making impact as the default. Um, and I think that 
gets me really excited that I can help other people be creative. And I think I don't have a better answer than that. That's great. So just kind of exploring the flip side of that a little bit, what do you think are some of the challenges that Refi is facing right now? I can, I can start with this one. <laughs> I mean, I think we haven't yet actually seen uh, a lot of success with real world assets on chain. And I think a lot of refi, um, you know, we're seeing local currencies, but then we're also seeing like carbon credits on chain. And I think there's this, I think a lot of different like schools of thought. And I think one of them is like, oh, blockchain is really, really good for, you know, accurate reporting of things. You know, there's still the Oracle problem that I don't think we've solved. And, and I think um, being pragmatic about that is important uh, so that we don't, you know, start making broad claims that blockchain solves all the issues in carbon markets, we still need a lot of digital, you know, monitoring solutions and the actual on the ground stuff has to happen. And, and that is, you know, hopefully coming soon. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is like, how do we bridge real world data onto the blockchain? For me, it's how we navigate this transition from the traditional extractive economy to a refi economy. Um, for example, my team can't rely on just project tokens. They need to eat, they need to feed their families, they need to live somewhere. Um, and balancing this, having to play into traditional ways of thinking or traditional market dynamics. Um, for example, now we're all greatly affected by forces that are way beyond our um, reach, ec economics or forces. While we know that refi and this whole movement is extremely important, we still need to convince people that have traditionally have the resources that, hey, this is a good way to go. And I think how we navigate that is going to affect to a great, great amount how successful we will become. Because in the end, if people can't work for refi, if they can't live from refi, then they're not going to be able to participate. And then it will stay the small niche that we, um, yeah, hopefully don't stay. But um, I think it's something, yeah, critical. Um, I completely agree with you. And I wanted to kind of talk about like a real example of this too, which I know that you're living in in Curacao. So I just returned from uh, the, the Colectivo Festival in Curacao and it was this amazing and beautiful experience. If you guys have an opportunity to check it out, I think opening in December uh, officially. Um, but it was really impressive to see these communities where, you know, there's this belief that, um, you know, m most of the food is imported, this belief that you can't really plant food locally. And what Luke and team have done with these food forests and these community currencies has just been like so, so amazing. Um, and wanted to kind of think about, um, you know, these micro ecosystems that I think are emerging in areas like Curacao, areas like Brazil and Nigeria, what what is some of the ways that we should be thinking about like how to like cultivate and, and nurture them even more to your point that you know folks that are going to be working on refi, especially in these areas, need that like substance. But I'm you know I'm curious kind of what you're thinking there in terms of like how do we how do we continue to kind of grow these so they flourish, right? I think listening to each other and really trying to understand what's going on. Um, just two days ago, I was having a conversation with someone that I consider Web3 native. And at some point he said, yeah, I think Web3 is eh, kind of a scam. Nobody really uses it for real things. It's just, you know. And I told him, hey, I pay my team with USDC because my bank doesn't work. I have people that live from crypto because they're unable to open a bank account. Yeah. And to him, even as a Web3 native person, it was a shock. He's like, you're serious? Yeah. Like, yes, I'm very serious because if I send money with the bank, I don't know if it's going to arrive. I have to pay a lot of money. Um, so I think it's making clear the needs of these communities and better acknowledging those needs. It's sometimes hard if you're... Um, I spend a lot of my time in Amsterdam as well, and it's sometimes hard to explain the needs of people that don't have all these tools, that aren't living in a system that's relatively or developed. Um, and then kind of from that understanding, collaborating together on solutions, because another thing we want to avoid is that I have my perception of, oh, this is what we all need. And I go into a place that maybe has completely different needs and I just kind of push my own vision on them and say, this is what you need to do. This is how it works. Um, and I think that that's actually something that I appreciate a lot of Cello mm -hmm. is that they don't go out with just kind of a machine gun approach and pop, 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 we just go anywhere. You go where you see that it's needed and you work with the people that understand that and can do that um, Yeah, to come to a real solution because now we need to get real. We can't 
fake it anymore. We can't do the showbiz and uh, it's time for crypto and Web3 to reach real people. And I think, um, yeah, Salo is really at the front, forefront of that. I think em empowering um, local communities to kind of make their own decisions to create solutions that are going to suit their needs um, is is really a core tenant of of Cello and really proud to see that the ecosystem has embraced this as well. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing that's interesting as we kind of look at kind of consumer trends, we're seeing kind of with um, you know uh, the, the the newer generations this this focus on you know making consumer decisions based on like sustainable goods and really um, focused on like the values. Um, and I firmly believe this is going to translate into digital go goods as well and, and crypto. Something like, you know, 40% of young Americans have um, hold crypto uh, in their wallets. And I, um, I'm curious kind of like what you're thinking about this new generation of regens that are emerging um, and, you know, how we can help kind of support them on their journeys and um, and really, uh, you know, bring them kind of closer into the fold. I mean, I'm super excited for for the new generation of regions. I think a lot of them live in DreamDAO and in like other yes. like online communities. They're like Discord native. I don't know how they do it. I, I can't handle Discord. Um, <laughs> but I just have so much hope. I think, and and there's people. They're, they're the people that are gonna like help drive this movement where it has to go. What I really like about working with um, young people, I'm so young myself, but um, when we, we did a project with a group called Youth for Climate, they were all under 16 and doing kind of climate activist, activism in the Caribbean. Um, and when we onboarded them into wallets and crypto, they didn't have a pre-notion about how finance should work or how what a currency should be. And so they didn't have, they had a lot of questions, but no judgment. They're very open to it. Oh, what does this thing do? Why does it go up and down? Okay, cool, cool. I'll know that's go up and down. Um, so kind of having this blank sheet that is now luckily being programmed in a positive way, where traditionally you would maybe grow up and it's like you gotta make as much money as you can. You gotta, and now people, um, yeah, they grow up and it's cool to be positive. It's cool to be nice. It's cool to be vegan. I love it. It's it's we're, we're living in a in a time where that is acknowledged as a good thing, um, which is very different, I think, to. Um, than 20 years ago when it still was very possessive and you need to own things and you need to really show um, your expensive Rolex and what so. I think these, these new value systems and what we're doing here and what we're doing with Cello, really transmitting those value systems through technology and through money is a really exciting thing. Um, so today, the way that crypto um, success is measured largely by the amount of TVL <laughs> that a platform or an application um, has and um, in 2019, one of my colleagues, Will Lee, wrote this paper called The Theory of Change. If you haven't uh, checked it out, definitely encourage it. There's going to be a V2 coming out in the next uh, few weeks here. But it was this concept of like, how do we redefine like, what success looks like? So it was looking at things like our basic needs being met, you know, are uh, people growing along their own path? Are we helping communities? And are we um, helping the planet? And I think, um, you know, so much of what we're talking about here kind of falls into this broader kind of theory of change, which to me is so different than looking at kind of TVL, which is primarily focused on kind of the whales. And um, I'm curious kind of as you think about regenerative finance, like how you think we should be kind of defining like, you know, five years from now, if we were to kind of look back, like what, how is success measured in refi? Yeah. How much nature was restored? How many people have access to like financial inclusion? Like, I think focusing more on like utility and, and values. I, I like the examples that you gave as well. And we were just actually working on our KPIs for spirals and like, okay, number one was like carbon dioxide, right? It's, it's not users, it's not TVL, it's like actual tangible impact. How many people can be financially included by having access to a digital wallet and digital currencies that don't need to go through the financial, like the old school financial system. Um, so those are, I think, um, you know, we need to reimagine KPIs essentially, yes. uh, and then align around better North Stars. For me, it's autonomy, both on an individual mm. level and on a community level. Um, I've been lucky enough to be part of a lot of DAOs in the past three years. I was kind of early. Um, I think the decentralized part we got that easy. Yeah. Organization part, we've been doing that for decades, but being autonomous is something so new and something so hard 
really being in your place, being able to do that goes right into your values, both as an individual, but also as an organization. I think if we can enable more autonomy, we will enable better actions. Um, so for me, it's measuring the, yeah, the amount of autonomy that we can create on an individual level. It's a lot of providing people with value aligned work opportunities, allowing them to really put all their energy, ideas, thoughts, entrepreneurship into the right direction. And for organizations, it's the same, but then just for a bigger group and really allowing more and more people to buy into the refi value system and um, yeah, really utilizing the refi tools and values and kind of embodying it more and more. Um, I think that's how we all win in the end. Totally agree. And two um, examples for those of you that might be interested in checking this out. One is um, uh, refi rating by PrimeDAO which um, is a really great listing of projects that are in refi and how they're contributing. Um, and then more recently, uh, um, some folks in the Celo ecosystem, um, actually from um, friends of Pooley, Pull Together, launched impact cards, which are really great because it's also a way to kind of show at like an con like individual level how you yourself are contributing to things like universal basic income through impact market, under collateralized lending, um, through uh, Ethic Hub, um, and through, uh, through carbon offsets as well, which is really great. Um, so I encourage you guys to take a look at that if you, if you haven't. Um, I think we have a little bit extra time, so wanted to open it up to the audience to see if there are any questions from any of you. Don't be shy. Yeah. So how it will become from like, you know, the range is from $5 to $500, how it will become say like, you know, $50 or $55. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know there is laws that are coming out, but how, how, what, are, what are your thoughts about normalizing price? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. We should probably have like a, <laughs> I can talk for hours. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of prerequisites that are needed. One being price discoverability and transparency. Mm -hmm. Like we're right now at a point where like, we don't even know what people are paying. You know, you can buy a credit for like five dollars and then turn around and sell it for twenty, and nobody knows how much the middlemen are taking. I think there was a study that recently came out that showed like middlemen are taking between forty to sixty percent of the value chain, and only like ten to thirty are going to community. Like holy moly! Like <laughs> that's just absurd, right? So I think step one, transparency, right? And and the second prerequisite that we need is like actually better better units. If you look at like a carbon credit it signals one ton of carbon dioxide. It doesn't really yet have the metadata around like, oh, you know, was this avoided? Was this additional? And if these words mean nothing to you, we can also deep dive into that. But um, <laughs> there's also this concept around how long is it gonna be pulled into the ground for, right? Like depending on the methodology around pulling CO2 from the atmosphere into the ground, it's gonna stay there for a different amount of time because carbon is part of a cycle and it will naturally go back up. So. It, it makes sense to have like a range in, in pricing, but that means that there should also be a range in, in the value of those credits and, and the utility of them as well. If we keep operating inside of the paradigm of like using them for their utility of carbon offsets, does it make sense that you can claim an offset from protecting forest? We need to protect forest, but does it make sense that you can kind of claim to undo your emission with that? That's an open question. And I think there's, so many opinions on like what is high quality um, and at the end of the day I think you know we need the primitives first of like transparency, price discoverability and like just including all of that metadata in the unit of its, in, in the unit itself. I would agree. <laughs> I think that's spot on. Um, yeah, I think transparency on both sides on kind of in the market on the price but also on the data itself. I think one thing that bothers me a lot is the opaqueness around the data methods being used to um, capture carbon credits. Um, and I think as um, blockchain is a great enabler of trust, a great enabler of transparency, that we're going to see more and more of that kind of information cost just going down. We're still gonna have a range because there are different qualities and diff people have different preferences. Um, maybe I'm willing to pay a premium of a carbon credit that's taken a specific methodology or in a specific region, um, but at least we can take down a lot of the costs that you currently 
uh, yeah, incriminating a lot of that is information cost. I think one interesting way of pricing it is like right now it's priced based on, I mean, theoretically priced based on the cost of production. And I think there's an interesting different school of thought where you price things based on value add. And one way of thinking about value add is like the social cost of carbon. Um, so I think that's, I don't know, like 120, 170, something like that, above $100. So theoretically, if the social cost of carbon is over $100, the cost of undoing that or removing that or preventing that harm onto humanity should be priced at that. Um, which means that rather than like a $2 carbon credit, all of those should be priced higher and we can create indexes and have some kind of like more stable pricing. But it becomes stable not because every carbon credit is the same value, but more because we can create more intelligent indexes. Yeah. One thing that I think is also really cool to see is we're seeing these organizations come together. You, you guys are both members of Climate Collective. Um, and really, I think what you're seeing, these Web3 communities that are coming together to kind of what is to define what is that standard? How should we be thinking about it? Working with organizations like Vera and others. To, to define that, which I think is is really cool because now you're seeing this movement across these these different organizations and Web3, how do we tackle this together versus individually? Right. Any other question, any last question? Quiet bunch this morning. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I guess I would love just to kind of like close it out with maybe, um, you know, uh, one one word. What do you what, what what would you like to leave the audience with? One word. Let's go deep a little bit. Okay, yeah, word. yeah. Oh, <laughs> you, could do, you could do a few words if you want. Yeah. Emotion. I'm very emotional today. I, I think that for me, after being in this space now for five six years, I really resonate with what they said earlier today that. The topics that are being discussed here, the vibes that people here are so close to my heart and kind of what I hope to achieve. And this is truly unique. In the kind of six years of being in a space, it's only the last year and only once I discovered Cello did I find this crowd. And, and to me, it means a lot. And just to share like a personal story on that, Luke was one of the very first ReFi founders that I met in 2019 before Mainnet was launched. So it's really special to be up here. Yeah. I think my word is optimism. Yeah. Um, I think we have like smart people. We have all the right people in the room. We have um, a movement that's happening. We have the technology needed to like address the climate crisis. We can build a regenerative system. We just need to get more people to choose that and to know about that. Uh, and I think that's very hopeful. I'm very optimistic about the future, and I think uh, we can build a better world. I was going to leave on that note too. Hope, <laughs> hope was my word, and I share a lot of the same um, sentiment there. When I look at you know my nieces and nephews and some of the decisions that they're making, and all of us in this room, um, I am really inspired by the work and the path that we're on. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.